Blaise Pascal. A little background for him. He was born June 19th, 1623, died August 19th, 1662, and is of course still dead today. He was a French mathematician, physicist, and religious philosopher. He had a mystical experience in 1654 and began writing in philosophy and theology. He suffered from poor health and died at the young age of 39. His contributions include the following. He built mechanical calculators, he studied fluids, and he clarified concepts such as pressure and vacuum. He worked in projective geometry and probability theory. And there are some, um, on some accounts, probability theory was developed because the French nobles were very into gambling and they wanted to work out um, the matters of gambling, or so it's claimed. His major works include the Lettres Provinciales around 1660 and Pensees, uh, or Thoughts, in 1660 also. So what is his major claim to fame? Well, it is, of course, the wager, Pascal's wager. He begins in the following way. When it comes to God, because he is neither extension nor limits, we do not know the nature of God or if he exists or not. Now, he immediately then says, um, we do know his existence through faith because, to quote, in glory we shall know his nature. And he claims, we can know a thing exists without knowing its nature. Which, on one hand, seems plausible because if you encounter something, you know, strange and bizarre, uh, you would know that it exists without knowing its its nature. But then again, on the other hand, uh, if we're trying to figure out does something exist, we would have to know, you know, its nature to know that it is that thing. So it could kind of go either way. Again, on the one hand, you could say, yes, there's definitely that thing that exists, and we have no idea what it is or its capabilities or qualities. Then again, on the other hand, if our question is, does a particular sort of thing exist, like God, and we have no idea what the nature of God is, then we would have a hard time sorting out if he exists. But as far as Pascal is concerned, he believes we cannot uh, know God's existence except knowing he exists through faith. So for him, God cannot be known. And this again is through reason. Why not? Well, he argues like this. If there is a God, God is infinitely incomprehensible. Not just incomprehensible, but infinitely incomprehensible. Why so infinitely incomprehensible? Well, according to Pascal, since God is neither parts nor limits, he has no affinity to us. So, we're incapable of knowing either what God is or if he is. And since we lack affinity to him, we dare not undertake the decision of this question. So what he's arguing here essentially is that God is infinitely incomprehensible and we have no way of knowing that God exists and no way of even knowing what God's qualities are. Again, he, but of course he allows for, you know, for faith. Uh, it can allow us to know that God exists. So why cannot God be proven? Well, again, so far God is utterly incomprehensible and so we can't even undertake the question. But he contends that we cannot prove God's existence. And he notes that Christians cannot be blamed for not giving a reason for their belief because they profess a religion for which they cannot give a reason. And he says they declare it is a foolishness. And if they proved it, ironically and paradoxically, they would not keep their words. And he raises the obvious objection. This does excuse those who put it forth without reason. Because if someone says, I believe this without any reason whatsoever, I cannot give you reasons, then yes, they cannot give you reasons. But if someone accepts it, they're not excused because they would need reasons to believe. So what does Pascal do? Well, he's created himself a scenario in which he claims reason is effectively useless in knowing what God is and knowing whether God exists or not. Reason cannot help us here at all. Only, only faith. But he has a, as I'd say, a workaround, a fix, a hack, which is, of course, the wager. 
And he starts off with a tautology, namely, God is, or he is not. And that is not only true, but necessarily true. He claims reason can decide nothing here. And it is kind of poetic phrase. He says, there is an infinite chaos which separates us. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn up. What to wager? According to reason, well, you shouldn't bet for one or the other. Why not? Well, to use the obvious analogy to a tossing a coin, assuming it's a fair coin, you have no reason at all to select one or the other. The odds are exactly the same. And so a setup essentially is to set it up as a coin toss, that either God is or God is not, and it's 50-50. So how then do you wager? Well, he begins by here by saying, don't reprove for error those who have made a choice, for I know nothing about it. They might be blamed for having made not this choice, but a choice. A person who chooses heads and a person who chooses tails are equally at fault. They're both in the wrong. The true course, one might say, is not to wager at all. And that would seem to make sense because if it's just a coin toss and you have no way of deciding either way, then it would make sense to say, well, I'm not going to bet. You know, if you were um, walking along after the pandemic when that's an option and someone approaches you and says, hey, you want to make a bet on something and it's, you know, 50-50 and you know, so which do you pick? Which is, which is it going to be? The rational thing to say is, well, I have no way of choosing one or the other. Uh, I'm not going to wager. But Pascal says you've got to wager. It's not optional. You are embarked. He doesn't expand on this in the actual text of the wager, but you could probably come up with a variety of reasons why you'd have to choose. I mean, one obvious one would be, as you go through your life, you've either got to act like you do believe or you don't. The most obvious thing would be attending, you know, since Pascal makes it, you know, the Christian God and Christian church, attending, you know, church. And when people ask you, do you believe or don't you believe? So which do you choose? Well, he claims you have two things to lose, the true and the good. Two things to stake, reason and will, knowledge and happiness. And he claims your nature is two things to shun, error, being wrong, and misery, being very, very sad. And he claims reason is no more shocked in choosing one than the other, since he claims you must choose. So he sets it up by saying, you've got a bet. There's no way out of it for no super clear reason. So betting is required. So how should you bet? Well, what he says is this. Even though you can't know through reason that God exists or does not exist, and you can't know what God is or is not, he says, what we can do, though, is look at this like gambling. We can weigh the gain and loss in wagering that God is. So here's how he does it. If you gain, he claims, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. If you bet for God. Now we can set this up as a you know, simple gambling matrix, which would be like this. If you bet on God and God exists, you get infinite gain. You know, heaven essentially. If you bet on God and God does not exist, nothing. No gain, no loss. If you bet against God and God exists, then infinite loss. Uh, possibly hell. If you bet against God and God does not exist, you get nothing. And so just looking at, you know, gain and loss, the rational thing to do is not believe that God exists in the sense that you have a reason to, to accept that it's true that God exists, but the rational bet is betting for God. Because worst case, you get nothing. Best case, you get infinite gain. Betting against God, best case, you get nothing. Worst case, you get infinite loss. So the bet for God is the rational bet. Now, this can also be illustrated using, you know, a coin toss, using Pascal's own analogy. So imagine you, you get like a weird, weird game where, actually a pretty cool one, definitely one worth playing. 
you someone says, hey, I'm a you know I got a billion dollars. Now let's put up a billion for, on this bet. If you bet heads and it's heads, you get this billion dollars. If you bet heads and it's tails, uh, nothing. But if you bet tails and it's heads, you lose a billion dollars. If you bet tails and it's tails, you get nothing. Now, you have no reason to believe that it's going to be heads. No reason to believe it's going to be tails, 50-50. But the rational thing to do is bet heads. Because, again, if it comes up heads, you walk away a billion richer. And if you bet tails, well, I mean, if you bet heads and he gets tails, no loss. But tails is just... The best case is nothing. The worst case is a billion dollar loss. So, again, you have no reason to believe it's going to be heads, no reason to believe it's going to be tails, but the smart bet is betting heads because that's the best payoff. Now, Pascal does consider some obvious objections. One might be, although you're compelled to wager for not particularly well-explained reasons, but perhaps you're wagering too much. Now, then he goes through and breaks down essentially some gambling theory you know when is it rational to bet and that's a matter for you know essentially value theory games theory what is a rational bet and it'd be a question of you know probability of risk probability of gain the amount of gain the amount of law potential loss and of course obviously your your values in terms of tolerance for risk your desire for gain so it gets really complicated but just crunching you know the numbers he claims, if you have an equal risk of gain and loss, suppose you would get, you know, you, you get like a weird deal where you're you're betting and you get two lives instead of one. So you get like, you know, double your, your lifespan, but, but in a good way, not like you hit, you know, real old and then you're just really old and, you know, kind of the, um, the Greek myth like that, this where someone is immortal, but they just... They just keep getting older and older and older, so they live forever, but they, their body just keeps, you know, getting more and more broken down. But you get like a cool deal where it's okay, you'll live um, 200 years, but you're but you won't you'll age proportionally, so you'll be, you know, in really good you know really good shape up until you hit you know like say 190. So not so bad. And Pascal thinks this would be a good good bet because you put up your bet and you're putting two lives up for one. And if you bet, you know, you win the two lives. So good deal. Now, again, mathematically, what you're doing is risking one at a 50% chance to get two. And depending on your view of like what's a sensible bet, this you know could be seen as sensible because you have a 50% chance of getting two and you're risking one. And so it's an equal equal bet. You're risking one to gain two, 50% chance, so equal bet. Now, if there were three lives to gain, if you're putting up one life to gain three, then he claims you would have to play. It would be imprudent if forced to play not to risk your life to gain three, if there's an equal risk of loss and gain. Well, on one hand, if you're forced to play, then you're forced to play, so it really prudent or not prudent doesn't enter into it, which, you know, is a point of criticism. So if somebody, you know, you're in kind of like a supervillain scenario where the supervillain says you must play my you know my dice game uh, or my my coin game and there's no no escaping well yeah you've got to play so prudent or non-prudent doesn't really enter into it now so getting back um, to his main point though essentially what he's saying is when you're looking at the risk and the gain and the odds then it would be a smart smart bet just looking looking at the math of it now, in the case of the, the God bed, he claims there is an eternity of life and happiness. And even if there were an infinity of chances with one chance to win, he claims it would be right to wager one to win two. It is stupid, he says, as you must wager, to refuse to stake one life against three when the chance of winning is one in infinity, if there were an infinity of an infinity happy life to gain. But there is an infinity of an infinitely happy life to gain, a chance of gain against a finite number of chances of loss, and what you stake is finite. And where the infinite is, there is not an and there is not an infinity of chances of loss against that of gain, you must give all. If one is forced to play, he must renounce reason to preserve his life, rather than risk it for infinite gain, as likely to happen as a loss of nothingness. 
So he says a lot of stuff there. But essentially it boils down to this. Once you do the, the math, you know, 50-50 shot, infinite gain, if you bet four god to get it right, then that's a smart bet. It's, you know, because the gain is just so incredible. And of course, as he keeps stating, you've got to play. And he even seems to, to put in there that even if the odds were, say, one in infinity, if you have an infinite gain, it would still be a rational rational bet because the, the payoff is so, so high. And again, this kind of comes down to, do you just go by the straight up math, you know, calculating numerical gain and loss and odds and stuff? But you also have to, as the criticisms we'll see at the end, they to also take into account matters of, of value, not just straight up, you know, mathematics. Now, a person might object and say, it's uncertain if we will gain. It's certain that we risk. But he says, in response, you know, he has a counter to this, because someone might say that the infinite distance between the certainty of the stake and the uncertainty of the gain equals the finite good, which is certainly staked against the uncertain infinite. So it's his reply, because the objection basically is um, essentially bad, you know, it's not a good bet. So his reply back is this. A player stakes a certainty to gain an uncertainty, yet stakes a finite certainty to gain a finite uncertainty without transgressing against reason. So what he's basically saying back here is this. The objection is, I'm risking a certainty against an uncertainty, you know, gambling. And Pascal says back, this is, you know, this is done all the time, you know, without transgressing against reason, basically rationally. And it's something, you know, that seems to be right. For example, every time we do anything, we're taking a risk. And so we're, we, we're putting up a certainty to gain an uncertainty. Whenever we take a, you know, take a chance. And not just in gambling, you know, pretty much all through life. And so it does seem to be right that we do stake certainties to gain an uncertainty. So, again, if someone starts a business, they could just, you know, if they have their money, suppose someone's got $10,000, they could just stick it in the bank and have, you know, be pretty sure they would get that tiny, you know, amount of interest. Or they could open a business, with which would be, you know, uncertain. Yeah, it wouldn't be irrational assuming the person's got a plan, etc., cetera, to, to take that risk. So Pascal seems to be right, which is, yes, it's not irrational to put up a certainty against an uncertainty, in other words, to take, take risks. And Pascal says in the case of, you know, God, there's an infinity between the certainty of gain and the certainty of loss, and the uncertainty of gain is proportioned to the certainty of the stake according to the proportion of the chances of gain and loss. What is kind of his way of saying it's a good, crudely put, it's a good bet. So the objection is, you know, generically is, we're putting up something certain for uncertain. So, bad bet. Pascal says back, no, that's perfectly reasonable to put up a certainty for an uncertainty. This is rational behavior. I mean, with obviously, you know, particular exceptions for stupid bets. And so he thinks it's a, it's a good bet. Now, in terms of the risks, if there are equal risks on both sides, he says, the course is to play even. The certainty of the stakes is equal to the uncertainty of the gain. So far is it from the fact that there is an infinite distance between them. And he says, the proposition is infinite force. When there is the finite to stake, there are equal risks of gain and loss, and the infinite to gain. This is demonstrable, he claims, uh, and if men are, ca are capable of any truths, this is one. Again, so the gist of his reasoning is God exists or he doesn't. So how do you bet? You bet for God and you're right, infinite gain. Uh, bet for God and you're wrong, nothing. You bet against God and you're wrong, infinite loss. Bet against, uh, bet against God and you're right, you gain nothing. You might object, okay, you know, it's a bad bet. And Pascal says, no, if you look at the gain and, you know, and loss and the odds, it's a great bet. And betting itself, he says, can be rational. So I think he's wrapped up all the objections. But there's a catch, because there's always a catch. So when you're doing gambling, you know, suppose you're you're playing that the weird uh, billionaire, you know, coin toss game. The billionaire doesn't require that you actually believe, you know, 
what the outcome is. But that would, you know, but that would definitely change the game. If um, the billionaire came up to you and said, you know, you know, suppose it's uh, like Elon Musk and his latest invention is a brain scanner. And he says to you, OK, well, we'll you know, we'll flip a coin. And if you truly believe it's going to be heads and you're right, I'll give you a billion dollars. But if you truly believe it's going to be tails and it comes up heads, uh, you owe me a billion dollars. And if it comes up, uh, if you truly believe that it's going to be heads and it comes up um, tails, no loss. If you truly believe it's going to come up tails and it does, you know, you get nothing. But you got to truly believe and my brain scanner will, will tell. Now that would change the game because if you're just doing a bet, Obviously, the rational thing to do in that weird billionaire coin toss game is you bet heads because the worst case scenario is you walk away with nothing. You definitely don't bet tails because if you bet tails, then you owe the billionaire a billion dollars. That would be, if someone they're going to enforce it, which I guess they would, then it would be very bad. But if you have to believe, that would change things. You have to make yourself believe it, which would be kind of hard because you would know it's 50-50. You, you know, no matter how much you say to yourself, okay, I really want the money, I really want the money, I really want the money, it'd be kind of hard to do. And so the catch in Pascal's wager is this. You're betting, but you've got to believe. You just, you just can't, like, put your, put your, you know, marker down on God and just say, okay, okay, God, you know, I believe in, I believe in you, uh, wager done, on with my life. You've got to actually believe. So what should you do? Well, he's got advice. He says, you know, I am forced to wager and I'm not free, but so made that I cannot believe. What should I do? And he says, learn your inability to believe since reason brings you to this and you cannot believe. Endeavor to convince yourself, not by proofs of God, because there are none, but by abatement of passions. You would like to attain faith and cure yourself of unbelief. Learn from those who have, who have been bound like you and who stake all their possessions. They know the way which you would follow and are cured of an ill of which you would be cured. Follow the way they began, acting as if they believed, taking the holy water, having masses said, etc. And he says, this will naturally make you believe and deaden your acuteness. But you might say, but this is what I'm afraid of. And perhaps rightfully so, because it sounds like he's advocating... Um, you're going through brainwashing, going through like a cult process, you know, join the cult, just keep going until you accept it. What do you have to lose? Now, he says, this is what will lessen the passions, which are your stumbling blocks. So his view is essentially is what you should do is make yourself believe. And the reason why, again, is for the payoff. So his closing point is this. The catch is you've got to really believe. You just there's no like bureau betting where you go up and say, yep, put my, put my money down on God done. Um, see ya when I die, you've got to actually truly believe to do the wager. And again, reason tells you it's, you know, 50, 50. So what do I do? And Pascal says essentially brainwash yourself, totally brainwash yourself. And that's how you win. Now, as you might imagine, since everyone doesn't just say, you know, Pascal's wager, you know, by, by, on God's side now, there's got to be some problems with it. So what are the problems? Well, first, the disjunction is obviously fine. Uh, it's a tautology. God exists or God does not. That's totally true, necessarily true, always true, can never be false. So what's the problem? Well, the first problem, standard problem, is this. The false dilemma you know, slash many gods problem. While it's true that God exists or God does not, it is also true that Thor exists or Thor does not, and so on for all possible gods. You just keep throwing in, you know, get a copy of, um, you know, book listing all gods, or, you know, go to like a, you know, role-playing game like you know, Dungeons and Dragons, bust out the old deities and demigods, and just start reading out gods, you know, from, from mythology. Quetzalcoatl, Odin, Loki, uh, you know, Tiamat, uh, etc. Just keep reading them off. And those all become part of the disjunction. And then, of course, you got to throw in, you know, 
um, current religions. And then you've got to start considering other possible gods. Like what other gods might there possibly be? Uh, and you, they're all possibilities. Because again, Pascal says you, you don't know. So Pascal can be accused of presenting a false dilemma. And this is something we, we looked at uh, when we talked about you know, Socrates talking about death being nothing to fear. And a false dilemma occurs where someone says, you know, you've got two options, P or Q. Uh, but actually the case is, it's not just P or Q, it's or R, you know, Z, etc. Now, the reason why this has logical appeal to it is that if you just have, you know, premise one, P or Q, premise two, not P, conclusion Q, that's a valid argument. Because if there's only two possibilities, like on a true-false quiz, and the answer is not true, it's got to be false. The false dilemma occurs when someone presents there only being two choices, as if there's only the two, but there's actually more. So, the many gods problem is this. There are many more options than just two. Perhaps an infinite number. Not only every god that humans have thought up all the gods people have imagined like <clears throat> like Cthulhu and Hastur and Krom and so on just think of all the gods of you know fiction video games etc and then you got to consider all the gods that we haven't thought of so potentially infinite number of choices so given you know god or infinite choices bet for god uh well that's changes the odds quite a bit so it'd be like going to the coin toss game where some you know you run into elon musk and he says guess what i've got an infinite sided coin um what you're gonna bet <laughs> and that would be you know crazy because when the coin flips you know comes up on one of the one of those the odds of guessing the correct one would be astronomical but there is kind of interesting out here or counter given pascal's view even if the odds of being right are one in infinity, you could say that God is the best bet. Because if God rewards you for believing in him infinitely, then that would be the one to bet on. Because your odds are one in infinity, but your payoff is infinite. So that would seem to be still, even in that scenario, the best bet. But is it still the best bet? Well... This takes us to a second problem. Pascal argues that we cannot know God, which is why we need the wager. And the way to bet is not based on knowing about God. It's explicitly based that you can't know God. So the way to bet is based on the payoff and the loss. And the problem is this. If we cannot know God, we cannot know how he would react to our belief or lack of belief. Without this knowledge, the potential payoff and potential loss, if God exists, cannot be known. And without knowledge of the payoff and loss, there is either no rational way to bet, or it might seem that betting against God is perhaps the better bet, because you wouldn't have to spend time like at church, etc. So when combined with the many gods problem, the problem becomes even worse. So looked at in the matrix form, you bet on God, God exists. What happens? Dunno. You bet on God and God does not exist. Uh, nothing. Maybe a plus. Maybe minus. Who knows? You bet against God and God exists. Who knows? No idea what God does. You bet against God and God does not exist. Nothing. Maybe a plus. Maybe a minus. Like maybe you get more time on you know Saturdays or Sundays. More sins or something. And so there's no way to rationally bet. And this can be shown by looking at going back to our coin toss matrix. Suppose again, an eccentric billionaire comes up to you and says, hey, let's flip a coin. And you're like, okay. So if I bet, if I bet heads, what do I get? And he says, uh, you don't know. And if I bet heads and it's tails, what do I get? Oh, you know, nothing. Okay, if I bet tails and it's heads, what do I get? Uh, I don't know. If I bet tails and it's tails, what do I get? Um, well, you know, nothing. And so in that case, you have no idea to 
how to bet because you have no idea what happens. Maybe betting heads is good if you get heads. Maybe betting tails is good as you get heads. Um, you don't really, really know because you have no idea what the response is going to be. So ironically, we need the wager because, according to Pascal, we can't know. But if we can't know, we can't fill in God's reaction to betting for or against him. And without being able to fill that in, we have no rational way to decide how to bet. So the paradox of the wager is, if you need it, it can't work. And if it can work, you don't need it because you know God exists. The final sort of concern or objection is this. Various critics have raised the problem of ethics. That Pascal advises people essentially to engage in what would be considered uh, cult, you know, behavior. Just simply suppressing their reason and brainwash themselves into believing until they just accept on the basis of no reason whatsoever in order to gain something. And he claims there's no loss in doing this. And as you might imagine, many writers have questioned the ethics of believing that something is true solely for the sake of gain. And of course, there's also the moral question of intentionally impeding one's own rationality. So that takes us to the end of Pascal's Wager and also the end of part two.